You're tuning in to the Black Hollywood Live Network, featuring news, interviews, and commentary on all things Black Hollywood. Hollywood redefined. From Los Angeles, California, presented by Maria Menunos and streaming live thanks to Akamai Technologies. This is Black Hollywood Live Portraits, featuring intimate, in depth interviews with Black Hollywood stars and influencers. Black Hollywood Live, Hollywood redefined. You're listening to Black Hollywood Live. And now, the host for Black Hollywood Live Portraits, Dario Kristen. <laughs> Hey everybody, you're watching Black Hollywood Live Portraits. I'm your host, Daryl Christen, and here and joining me in the studio today is Courtney Stewart. What's up, everybody? And DJ Jesse J. What up? And we have a very special guest in the house today we're super excited about. You know him from directing some of our favorite films, such as Barbershop, Taxi, Fantastic Four franchise, Think Like a Man. Tim Story's in the house with us today. What's up, Tim? What's up, hey, Tim? Hey, guys. Whoa, whoa. Well, thank you for joining us. We're really excited. I mean, you have been just all over the news. I mean, everything you touch is like golden, man. You're like, you know, they call you the one billion dollar baby. You're the highest grossing <laughs> black director in Hollywood. How does that feel? Oh, wow. Um, it feels good. I mean, it makes you feel like. Uh, <laughs> How do you feel right now? You did something this right. Guy. <laughs> makes you feel like you did something right. So, no, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. It, it makes me feel good. Well, you know, we were discussing this earlier. Um, when, as whatever c career path you choose, your childhood affects a lot of how you grow up and, and what you become. Tell us a young Tim story growing. Tell us about the young Tim story growing up in L.A. What were you like oh, as wow. a child? You, you guys are going back. We're going to go back. Know all the way we want to know all about you. <laughs> wow. Um, so I'm born and raised in Los Angeles. Um, really, really close to Inglewood. Like literally, I'd live. If you cross the street, you're in Inglewood. So um, that's kind of the area I grew up in, and um, you know, grew up mom and dad, um, twin sister, older brother who was a musician. And, um, you know, my parents were just very big into anything that we fe um, showed an interest in. Um, they would immediately do whatever. I remember um, I also played golf, and I remember we used to, um, we, we dug holes in the backyard and started putting around with some sticks that we made in the clubs. And the next, you know, maybe the next month, my mom bought us clubs and we were out playing golf. So. As soon as you showed an interest in something, um, my parents just supported us in it. And so my brother had a movie camera that, you know, back then we didn't have video cameras. It was, yeah. This was late 70s or whatever it is. And, um, you know, uh, started shooting us, you know, family, family, you know, films and this and that. And at some point it got old to him and he gave it to me. And I was around 11 or 12. And I started shooting little movies in the backyard with my friends and, before you know it, you know, that kind of progressed into just really getting into the whole art form of it all. And while in high school, figured out that, you know, there was like, at the time, there were two two film schools that I had done, like, the research and found out they were the best. And, and it was actually three. There was, like, there was uh, NYU, there was yeah. Columbia, and of course, um, there was uh, USC. And, of course, USC was in town. So, <laughs> you know, I would go down there and kind of hang out, never could get in the buildings, but, you know, would hang out. <laughs> <laughs> At some point, um, started, you know, applying for it, got into film school, and, you know, and I guess after that, you know, did some independent films right after I got out, and then when I was enough in debt, went and started doing uh, music videos, and, like, about three or four years into music videos, um, got back into doing narrative film and, and started looking for an agent, and, and kind of got lucky. I had some friends around who... Uh, Barbershop was the one of the probably the second script I read in in Hollywood. Well, when you gave your brother the when your brother gave you the camera, I mean, what was it that made you realize that you wanted to go into that field? Like, I mean, do, and do you have any of those videos? You know, I do. We found a few of them that I now have them on on DVD. So it's kind of funny <laughs> to look back at. What it, was the theme that you well, you, you know, the, used to? I think the first one was I did a horror film. Um, where you could, uh, one of my neighbors put on a mask and kind of chased whoever else around the, the, the house or the backyard or whatever. <laughs> and then other ones would be um, kind of like superhero things where we'd act like, you know, back then it was Bruce Lee and, you know, karate and all that <laughs> stuff. So, Kung Fu theater yeah, on Saturdays. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> and, then, um, and, then I, and then interestingly enough, I started doing um, some stop motion stuff too. So I would, 
I had what was called square people way back in the day, yep. and, and <laughs> would um, you know, because they would stand up, you know, and you would you know shoot a frame and then move them, then shoot a frame and move. Them. So I would even do that kind of stuff. So I got into stop motion and. You know, and, and back then you had to kind of send in your film, get it developed and bring it back and this and that. So when you would see it, it just kind of made it cool, you know, and you started doing split screen stuff where you could do like a little bit of in camera effects. And I just really got into it. There was something about being able to create worlds and, and kind of go somewhere else that was kind of interesting to me. So. And whose world as a child kind of inspired you to create your own? Well, it was it was sci-fi in the beginning. Like it was, you know, definitely Star Wars and yeah. and um, you know, and, and then of course um, some of Lucas's stuff that I could see. You know, it, Star Wars stuff was easier to see. Lucas sometimes gave me too horrific. Like it took me a <laughs> while to get Jaws. You know, wouldn't let me watch Jaws. But um, and then a lot of cartoons. You know, you know, Super Friends and and all of that and and just kind of um you know even the the disney movies chitty chitty bang bang and all yeah. of those yeah. movies i just was into and would watch them over and over again even the godzilla movies it was just i was into sci-fi and magic and all of that stuff and just kind of watched them whenever they came on it was you know in hindsight the addiction was pretty was pretty crazy <laughs> well it sounds yeah. like even at an early age that you had a a sort of clear vision on what type of films you wanted to create or what projects you wanted to work on. You know, that's true. I, I did. It, it's really weird that um, when I look back, like, um, as far as my, my friends, my immediate friends and this and that, I knew what I wanted to do at 12, 12 years old. Wow. So it's interesting when you get a chance, an opportunity to, to actually make it as a living, you know. So it's it's never been... I've never really thought about doing anything else, you know. Yeah. It's, it's been that way since, you know, 12, 13. Well, I mean, we, it clearly shows because of your success that you have right now. Thank you. Thank but you. Now, you mentioned, we're going to get into your film career in, in a, a little bit later, but let's go back to this rap syndicate ah, portion ah, of your portion life. Of life. I figured so you were the, you were, yeah, you know, we, we did a little <laughs> research, found a little bit of things about you, and, and, and it said that you were in a group that Ice-T produced. Yeah. I, yep. How did you get involved with rap syndicate? Well, you know... I'm I'm a you know black kid in Los Angeles <laughs> and you know you either danced rapped or you were an athlete you know there there was something you did and I got into rapping fairly early on it was break dancing at first it was rapping and I had a group that um, was during my high school years where uh, we would go out and perform and we got we, we were seen by Ice T at some function in the in the city and um, he asked us to come open up for him in a couple of gigs. And that turned into us opening up for him a lot in a few gigs and kind of traveling over the state because we couldn't really go outside the state because we were, you know, 14, 14 and 15 yeah. and we <laughs> couldn't really go anywhere. But um, he would always let us, uh, you know, open up for certain shows. And so that kind of turned into like the little career in high school. And then, interestingly enough, the last year of, my, of high school, um, one of my members was shot and killed. And it kind of disbanded the group a little bit. You yeah. know, we kind of went our separate ways. And in hindsight, it kind of took me back to what it is I wanted to do, which was um, which was making movies. And I kind of just even still hung around Ice T because at that point he was getting big too as well, and he was starting to do music videos. So I would hang out there and just kind of get into that whole thing. He even at one point bought me equipment. Oh, wow. for, while I went to um, film school, he ended up buying me some editing equipment and this and that. So he was very supportive of go do your thing, you know, and um, and I just kind of took that lead and the support of, you know, people around me and just kind of went for it. Now we have a little test for you. You don't have to do it, but we, you know, we just need we 10 seconds. Oh, we would boy. love for you to do it. We hear that you got a lot of skills on the rap side. So could you give us no, like spit us 10 no seconds, way. 10 <laughs> seconds. Won't seconds. happen. We'll even go down to five Won't seconds. Five seconds. Won't happen. Won't happen. Won't happen. No. Five seconds. No. I can't. No. <laughs> Your that you is go, so. You can even go your current line of your favorite rap song right now. No. We even we even break out. I don't. I can't even think of something. <laughs> I can't. That's how bad. Like that's how bad this is right now. I can't even think of anything. Like, <laughs> no way. No. 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 <laughs> I'm, mean, not not I'm, not not I'm not we doing tried. it. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. Are you still close to Ice T? Are you? Do you guys? Yeah, still very communicate? close. It's it's interesting. We I just saw him in um Vegas. We were shooting the um sequel to Think Like a Man. And um, Coco has a, a part in it, and so I got to see Ice T came down and hung out with us, and it was uh, it was awesome. You know, it, we we kind of find each other every year, you know, once or twice a year, and just kind of say what's up. And um, 
you know, it's like old times. He came on the set. We were just kind of hanging. He's extremely proud of me. He's always been very supportive. So he's just like, Tim, whatever you need, and vice versa. So that's cool. Very cool. So now we'll, you're, you're at US, US, USC is around <laughs> this time. Um, you're, you have a pretty clear vision on what you want to do. Do you remember your first project that you actually created at USC? Yeah, there was a, there was a course we had which was called 290. And in 290, you had 8 millimeter film that you had to literally go out and shoot a movie. Um, almost a movie every every two weeks or something like that. And just, you know, it's uh, it only has to be like three minutes long. It doesn't okay. have to be anything crazy. And um, the first one I did was, it was dumb. It was like, <laughs> it, was, it was a movie in which my friends were driving their car stops and they see a house and it looks haunted, and they go into it, and they <laughs> get scared, and they realize, you know, while they're in it, doors are closed, and this and that, and they realize that it's just a cat in the house. I mean, it's the dumbest thing in the world. <laughs> they end up running out and getting in the car and driving away. And, it, like, literally, those are the little things we did. And then at some point, I did a um, kind of a, my, my first, I guess, long form, when you say long form, maybe six minutes long, long or whatever, was a... Um, a movie I actually did with Faison Love. Oh, wow. Faison was the star of the movie, and it was about, it was like my version of E.T. comes to the hood and just. <laughs> E.T. comes to the hood. I like you know, that. I just, like that. He ended up in the wrong neighborhood and gets, <laughs> gets killed. So, Faison. <laughs> well, that's, a, that's a nice sinister twist yeah, on E.T. Just, he, I, think we, I think you need to release that. He, I think you need to go back to that He project. came to the wrong neighborhood. <laughs> and so, Faison was the star of that, and it was. Um, it was really, you know, just a quick little short. So those are kind of the projects we did way back then. So you were creating that, and is there a particular style of, like, camera? Or I know you mentioned film. Mm -hmm. you know, what is the style of camera that you typically like to use? Or even when you started going to USC, was there something? Now like, or back then? But is, has well, it changed since It's back changed then dramatically. Now? Like, back then, it was all film. So you started off with 8 millimeter, and then you went to 16 millimeter, And then at some point, it was vi there was some video projects you did, but it was literally you know, the tape, and you had to put the tape in and all that stuff like that. So there was no digital, you know, j yeah. digital editing back then. This was, I got in in 89, 88. Or, um, so, and then now, you know, it's totally digital. I've, I've shot my last, I think, three movies completely digital, and even some of the, the Fan 4 movies, we shot a lot of the visual effects stuff on, on digital format. So it's trained drastically. Even if you yeah. go up to the school now, it's, you know, all the old buildings have pretty much been torn down, and it's uh, completely different. Everything's digital, so. How do you feel about that transition? Do you feel like there was anything that has sort of been lost because of the transition? Do you just feel like it? You know, I, I, there, there are pros and cons. Like, I love the fact that um, just the immediacy and uh, of, of getting the footage back, as well as I don't have to worry anymore about how much film. Like, I'm one of the directors that doesn't, I don't, between takes, I don't really like to yell cut all the time because once you yell, cut you know people come in and make up you, nice. you know and you lose you lose your kind of your your rhythm so i didn't like to cut but i would keep the camera rolling which means film is just spewing yeah, through the spewing, yeah. so it, it does make it easier because now it's just you know it's digital tape is much uh, much easier simpler to deal with as well as it's cheaper but then you do lose things like what i found with the last film i did is the cameras are getting so they're getting so good that the resolution is actually becoming a, a weird look. Yeah. So we have to compromise by, by bringing lenses that are older so that hopefully we can soften the image. So at some point, the cameras will probably, I'm already at the point where I don't even want them to get better. Like wow. they're, they're fine. They're good. You know, they're, good. they're good. Like <laughs> leave them alone. But, you know, we're at, you know, now Sony just came out with an 8K camera and, you know, people are going to, you know, we're human nature. We yeah. always want to make it make better and better. better. But, yeah. We don't need it. Like I'm, I'm good with 4K. You know, it's it's fine. You know, because it looks really close to film. So there are some pros and cons to it, but mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah, you, you deal with it. And earlier you mentioned uh, as some of your influence of movies, Jaws. I know Steven Spielberg is a huge supporter of USC uh, School of Cinematic Arts. Was he involved in any of the projects that you did, or did you see him a lot, or have any interaction yeah. with him while you were there? Yeah, no. Back in the day, I think he might have come once okay. for for um, a seminar or talk to us. This. I must admit, I see him um, a lot more now. Yeah. He and George and, and a lot of the guys that are, you know, Brian Singer and, and Singleton and, and a lot of the guys that are that I deal with the school now because um, it's 
such a big school now, yeah. with, which Luke is giving the money for it. It's huge, and it has so many, you know, game. You know, they have a gaming, you know, a game um, development, you know, building now, and they are, they do a lot of stuff with visual effects, and it's just huge. So I actually see those guys a lot now, um, and also I'm a supporter of the school as well. So, but back then you didn't. You didn't really see them, you know. They were they were much into their careers at that point sure, too. Right. Yeah. Um. So there it was. It wasn't often that they were able to come down and visit because they were doing their thing. Yeah. And then even with music, you we've mentioned that that you had a lot of music background and you started doing uh, music videos and also producing musical shows after you graduated. I know a lot of people think that once you graduate from film school that people are just lining up to your door <laughs> yeah. with scripts. They're waiting to give you a billion dollars <laughs> like you've grossed in this yeah. industry. What What is the real, real realisticness of that? Like what, what it really happens for a film student who graduates? It's, it's interesting you ask that question. It, it. Now it depends. It depends what you, if you've decided what it is you want to do. Because there are some, you know, when you go through the school, you don't immediately say, I want to do this. I kind of knew coming out, I wanted to direct. There wasn't there wasn't anything else I wanted to do. Camera, sound, nothing. I wanted to direct. So it depends what you want to do. If you are if you come out of that and say, I want to be a DP, that's a different road. Yeah. But me being a director, knowing that I wanted to direct, there's only one thing you can do, and that is you have to start directing. I did a couple of PA jobs. I remember doing a PA job on a Paul Hunter video and um, worked in, with another friend of mine, uh, Christopher Erskine, who's a director that, that went to school with me too. And literally, I did like two jobs and said, okay, I'm not doing any more of that. Yeah. <laughs> and literally started making little sh movie shorts. You know, I would take scenes from a movie that I enjoyed and I would just reshoot it, you know. So, and if I could get my hands on a script that I knew a movie was being made and it was coming out, I would shoot a scene from that script because I would take away the whole issue of, of writing, you know, because right. so... um sometimes what makes us not get better is the material that we're able to shoot. So I would just get great material and not worry about where it came from and just shoot it and then compare my work with what somebody did. And, um, and so, and, and, and basically the reason why I was doing that is to get, there's something that I call, I always say you can't fake confidence. Yeah. You know, you might, you think you can, but yeah. you can't fake confidence to people who really know what, you know, what it is. And, um, and that was to get my confidence up in directing. And at some point, I remember I saw um, this movie, Clerks. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Clerks. And classic. I, That's a classic Yeah, it's a movie. classic. It's a little right? cult classic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so I remember they, one in, one, in the n newspaper one point, they printed the recipe for making a film for 25 grand or 27 grand, whatever it, it cost. And I remember cutting it out and saying, I'm going to make a movie for, you know, 27 grand. And literally went and did that and just you know got the camera got my friends you know all my friends were in it all my friends were behind the camera you know if you weren't in the scene you were sh you were hitting record you know <laughs> so and literally just shot a movie a full feature and um after that you know was able to sell it and um you know made it, it cost about 27 so i made my money back and then um shot another one which you know went up to like 200 grand i thought it was gonna cost me 60 but um you know, but it ended up costing 200 grand, and so I'm in debt, and um, you know, and literally went to music videos to try to pay off that debt, and you know, and music videos kind of led you to, you know, and you just kind of got away from narrative film for a second, and at some point came back to uh, looking for a real film. And then your first independent film was One of Us Tripped. Yeah. Yep. And so, how did you even create the concept of, of forming that? Well, I, I figured, okay, I need to write it because I couldn't really depend on anybody to write it for you. You know, so often it's we become writers out of necessity because yeah. I can't really depend on somebody <laughs> to write it for me. So I remember I, I said, let me figure out the, the job with the least amount of brain power that I need to use. And so <laughs> I became a messenger. And, you know, and while being a messenger, I would write the script while I'm sitting down waiting for a call. And um, when I would you know, wasn't working, I'd be writing the script. And then as soon as I finished the script, I quit. And basically said, I'm going to go make this movie and started, you know, getting money from friends and selling. I mean, back, way back then we had Laserdisc and, you know, a lot of CDs, I, you know, back when they would actually sell, buy CDs from you. And I started selling everything I had, anything I had in my house that I could sell, I sold it. And um, went to make this movie and, and you know, was uh, 
successful in completing it. And you won an award for the Black Filmmakers Hall of Fame? That's that? correct, yeah. And now, did you feel at that point like, I've made it? Like, I have this award, I've done this independent film, I produced it, I wrote it, I directed it. Like, did you feel like, I am on my way? Like, the billion dollars are, <laughs> are they're coming, coming to the door now. the minute I leave. Well, here's what's weird about it. Like, I, the, my biggest wish when I was from 12 and whatever it was, was to have my movie in a theater with a packed house. That was it. So I remember renting out the, the Baldwin Theater, which is no longer, but it was the only black-owned theater, like literally, I don't want to say in the nation, but definitely on the West Coast or something like that. And um, I screened it there with all my family and friends, and it was a packed house. And um, that was the moment, and it's weird, there's a moment where you just say, I did, I did that, and it, it was never about money. You know, it's like I couldn't even, I couldn't even equate money with filmmaking at the time. Yeah. It was just, I know I love doing this, and it, it was a the triumph where you just say, hey, I did. Like I, there was this, this was the dream since I was like 13. So to do it in '95 was like okay. So you took a moment, and then, like human nature, you go, okay, I got to do the next one, and yeah. you just. You just pick right back up and just keep going. So I don't think there was ever a, a moment where I said I made it. Like, you don't, I, I don't know what it is about me and maybe about many other artists. You just don't, um, you just can't quit. You yeah. kind of kept it moving. Yeah, you kept it moving. But did I'm, you give yourself a chance to enjoy it, though? That's like, you know. Well, no. What's weird about it is, no, I didn't. And, and I've had to learn to do that, you know, in the later in, in life and, and being able to do more movies and stuff like that is learn to, to open the champagne and, and relax yeah. for a second, but I'm still in the mode of what's next. And, you know, film, like what I do like about film is there's a completion to it. There is a moment where yeah. it's over and you have to learn when to say, you know, like they say, films aren't finished, they're just abandoned, you know? And there's a moment to say it's done and move on to the next one. And, you know, it, that's what happens now. When I when I complete movies, it's, okay, what's what's next? But you do learn to you know, go on vacation and, you know. So how it. long is your process as far as when you first started and, you know, completing a project and obviously being hungry to jump on to the next one where now, you know, you've had a lot of success. What is your time frame before, you know, you really, I mean, obviously, because if you're working on a movie, you're going to have four or five ideas yeah. coming to you for future projects. So how long do you give yourself in between? Well, it's getting shorter, which scares <laughs> me. You know, it's, it's like literally, I, we just wrapped thing two two weeks ago mm -hmm. and I'm already like pitching ideas and working on scripts for the next one and I haven't even started my director's cut for thing two so it's getting scarier that that I that I want to move on so fast but you have to really I there's a discipline where you have to just stop and go all right make this what it needs to be and kind of be in the present and kind of just make sure what you have is the best it can be and then so the process is getting uh it's getting short, which scares me. Um, <laughs> before a project is even finished, I'm thinking about what the next That's one nice. is. And, and really, I think that really begins when I feel like the film has taken on the life that it needs to take on. There's yeah. a moment where you go, okay, now it's starting to, you know, get its legs under and now it's starting to... So um, as soon as I hit that, the brain starts to kind of, all right, what's next, you know? Because then at some point, once we hit, like, picture lock, then music and mixing it and everything like that is is an e is the easier part of it. It's kind of not your world anymore. It's more of just hey, turn that up and turn that down, you know. And did it help you by having a music background to be able to mix a lot of your own music or even have those choices? You know what? It, the weird thing about it is, I, I would say there's a rhythm that I that is kind of internal. That when I, when a scene like and I do comedy for you know for comedy and some fantasy fan, fantasy stuff, but. For comedy, there's a rhythm to it, and, and when I look at films, there's a rhythm that I'm looking for. And once, once it hits that rhythm, then it's 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 great. You know, there's yeah. times where it doesn't, and you just have to, you know, sometimes put a band aid on the scene because it's just not moving the way it probably should. But um, there is a rhythm to all this that I do kind of equate with, with me having the music background. That um, I could never describe it to you, but it's just when a when a scene starts to have a rhythm to me, it's kind of like okay, cool, you know. But Why just not? A, oh, oh, go sorry. ahead, Courtney. <laughs> just to take it back, just a little bit. When you mentioned that uh, you had your screening mm -hmm. with your family, you packed the house, like that was the dream achieved. But at that point, you still hadn't quite equated the whole like money idea to it all. 
what what was the point where sort of the business of Hollywood and the creative energy for you kind of met and you were like this is career this is also you know my financial well-being like what was that moment like and how did that come about well I think it hit with um, I think it hit with barbershop mm -hmm. you know I think barbershop opened and it did you know we knew we had we had already um, screened it for enough audiences so we knew that it, it was having a really good response. As soon as you could get an audience in the room, we knew, hey, you're going to have a great time. But in terms of what it was going to make, you know, we threw out, hey, it could maybe make 35. We were like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that would be great. You know, so there was that thing. And when it, when it went beyond expectations, it was the response to what it did and where I finally realized, oh, I'm getting, I got like, I started to get these opportunities that although I felt they were warranted, um, because I worked my ass off, that <laughs> I did. I did notice that they were different than either some of my peers, um, you know, uh, opportunities or the fact that I remember being in one meeting, an executive, and he literally told me, said, "Look, I haven't seen your movie, but I was told I need to sit down with you," and wow. that was the moment I went, wow. "Oh, mm. okay," because it, sometimes it doesn't even have to do be about the movie. It's yeah. about what it does and how much money it made or whatever the case may be. So. That was kind. Of, it was kind of the aftermath of of um, barbershop that really made me go, oh, it's a business, and you know, if you do if you do a good movie, you know, and I started equating it to if you do a good movie, and of course the stars align and it makes money, well, you get to do another movie. And mm -hmm. I've even learned since then, you know, look, if it's a really really good movie and it doesn't make a lot of money, there's still the equation of you can make, you, you know, you get to make another movie. So it's um. It, that was kind of like the the moment where it kind of really punched me in the face that okay this is this is money this is business they want you to do another one because it made money it was even them greenlighting barbershop two it was we need to do another one which you look at barbershop one and you go there's no reason in the world why there would be a sequel to this movie <laughs> <laughs> there's no reason <laughs> and um except you know great characters and people are going to come again people and see these see right, and you go it. okay so let's figure out a <laughs> figure out a, a sequel so well you yeah. also are being very humble that grossed over 20 <laughs> <Right>. million dollars <laughs> <laughs> opening weekend which is forgive me a black director that's huge for any director right, right, first right. of all and especially back then it especially was. back then and you were hand selected by the producers to to direct the film correct like that. yes yes um i mean once again it was um you know being in the right place right time really good friend of mine as well as um my agent who became my agent later got a hold of the script got it to me and then I went in to meet with um, uh, Bob and George, uh, Bob Title and, and George Tillman Jr. And they basically said yes to me doing it. And what was cool about it is they really stuck by me. When we went into MGM, they said I hadn't done a comedy, you know, since, you know, before then. Um, even my two indie, indie films were like drama, quote unquote, yeah. kind of things. Because, you know, when you're young, you want to make Godfather. <laughs> um, you know, so they said, well, well, how do we know he's funny and this and that and all the other stuff. And um, those guys just said, nope, this is our guy. This is our guy. And it was, it was a weird time, too, because as a music video director, there was a stigma a little bit. It was kind of like we're not, you know, we can't be on time. We go over yeah. budget. We do all this stuff. So, um, but they really stuck by me and just kind of said, this is our guy. And, like, it was no wavering. And, and I thank them for that because it gave me my, my break. And then with you having this project and working with so much talent on the Eve and Anthony Anderson, Cedric the Entertainer, is there a, was it hard with this being your first kind of studio film to deal with all those egos? Even though they're all you know great in the industry, but it, was there a lot of egos that you had to no, deal with? No, I've been blessed. I've had the I've had the cast of life. Like literally, Barbershop was we had a ball. Like. That looked if, like a fun. It, it, it like was. A fun movie. If you came to the set of Barbershop, you like. I remember we, we had an ongoing joke that we, we just all knew the film was going to be terrible because we were like we were having so much fun making the movie. Um, you, we were all. It was during the winter in Chicago, in January, and um, oh. so we were all in the same <laughs> hotel. So we saw each other every night. There was a bar at the, the you know the bottom the you know bottom floor of the hotel. We'd all end up there after shooting. And on set, you know, we're playing music and, you know, because so much of us were on set at the same time, for, yeah. you know, because of the way the, the, the film was uh, conceived. So you're playing music and we were just, we were laughing all the time. You know, Cedric, you know, still to this day, just one of the funniest guys in the world. Sure. And we just laughed and had a ball, you know, always. You know, even D-Ray was a part of it and they would just keep us laughing and everything. So 
we um you know we just once again that cast there were no there were no egos like it was we were all there and there are times when a cast as well as a director and producer and whoever else involved needs the film to be good like you know we were at times in our career where we needed this movie to be great and we just kind of were all in in the present you know there yeah. have been there have been times where you've been on a set and you can you know somebody's dealing with whatever and they're just not 100% there but that film shoot was like we were all like we're trying to kick ass, you know. We, so it was it was pretty cool. I wish I was there. I feel the energy. <laughs> I'm, like, oh, it was, I'm like, man, I wish I was on set. It was a lot of fun. I could do without fun. the Chicago j in January, but well, that's <laughs> true. That's true. That's, well, that's a different what, subject. But what's weird is what that's what kept us work, together. Yeah. Like you didn't go outside and go. You stayed in in this on the set, and you kind of like you just kind of hung out. And so. it's interesting because you said you know the bar at the end of the thing. I can totally picture. That kind of inspiring the direction of almost the movie. Oh, absolutely! Just feeling that family, like okay, we're here creating. And we would, you know, crack jokes and mess with each other that night, and then something would turn up on the set yeah. next the next day that sometime was an inside joke that we'd make sure you know the audience got it too. But there were so many little nuances that we just kind of we kind of felt like we were making something special. So it was it was pretty cool. And as far as like doing like a movie versus the music videos, I mean, you've worked with like everybody from R, R. Kelly to NSYNC to everybody. And so what would you say is the difference uh, as far as working with musicians and actors as well, far as directing? You know, there's a, um, there, uh, what, what's the word for it? It's because you're dealing with dialogue and storytelling, you know, um, there have been a lot of there were a lot of performers or singers or group you know group members or whatever you want to call it who really got it like when I worked yeah. with In Sync, you know Justin Timberlake was was standing next to me while I was shooting shots that sometimes that he wasn't in at times and it was like you can look at those guys and go okay wait a minute this you know this guy's different yeah. even working with Tyrese and even John B and even a lot of these guys were were interested in 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 doing it so. I think the you know the difference obvious obviously is is dialogue and there's more of a um a focus um a longer focus that you have to have because you're connecting a story mm -hmm. but even when I did you know videos with John B and Tyrese there was still a a even though they were small 4 minute you know stories I did a lot of story videos in my in my day like they weren't you know, hype was the king of, of image, imagery. The visuals, you know? yeah, yeah, the visual. The, like, visuals, the yeah. guy was just ridiculous. Yeah. And me, mine were always ending up being stories. So I did a lot of ballads. I did a lot of stuff like that where I had to tell stories. And uh, that's just something I gravitated towards. But the difference was just, you know, the, the longer, you know, the more the more focus on, on dialogue and storytelling. And I must admit, some of the artists did have that. But, um, you know, back then it was, it was about imagery. And, you know, it was... Um, you know, sometimes they, but then there were those who didn't have the focus of, you know, it was about this song and I, let's go, <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's get to the next one, you know, two takes and it's like, all right, I'm, I'm good. You mentioned the storytelling, like what's your process of a video versus a movie? How long does it take you to kind of create that type of storyboard for each individual? I mean, I'm sure it's different for every project, but is there kind of like a standard for music videos versus your um, wow, it's been a while since I've done music videos. I mean, back then it was me collecting. I would collect imagery, um, um, or like ongoing. Like even when I wasn't working, I'm doing magazines and I'm just tearing out. Back then you couldn't, you didn't have an iPad, so you were tearing out <laughs> tear sheets. And I had like books and books of just images that I've always seen. And what I would do is once you heard a song, if a song was, you know, because I did a lot of ballads and every now and then you would get, you know, these ballads that just speak to you, you know, and you could figure out, oh, and it reminds you of an image, and you would go get that image, and then you sometimes could build a story around that image. And that's kind of what you were looking for. You were looking for something to click, and then you write that treatment, and, and it's a little story at the end of the day. It's a little story, but you would always try to find a, a theme that you're kind of circling it a, around. And then when it comes to films, are, you know, films are a lot different. You know, once you're, you know, on a film... Once you've gotten the job, you're basically, um, you know, just in your world. You can shut the door. I mean, the good thing about film is, as opposed to videos is videos, you, you do it, and then you got to start looking for the next one. Yeah. And with film, it's when you're on a job, you're on there for at least a year, mm -hmm. you know. And so once I get that job and I know it's going and you've got a cast that starts to come together, you, you think about it a lot. And you kind of, you know, there's a lot of, I have a, you know, I do a lot in terms of script, you know, structure and this and that. 
and you've just got to make sure it makes sense, and you've got to go over character and yeah. look at a lot of movies, and just there's a th that process is pretty intricate. It's it's pretty detailed. <laughs> and b before we move on to music, I mean uh, your film, uh, with your as far as your music video goes, what's one of your favorite uh, videos that you've shot, and why? Um, I must admit it's, it's kind of I probably bring them up because I, I love the videos we did with them. It was it was Tyree Sweet Lady. It was. Um, um, also the one I did with him lately, and then there was um, John B. We did a, a, a couple. We um, one was uh, the Tupac duet that he did. That oh yeah yeah, yeah I, I forget. Are you still down? Are you still down? Somewhere in there. So yeah. that one is one of one of my favorites, and um, and I did one with Gerald Levert that was kind of cool, and it was just a concert video too. So um, you know, so there are. There are those that you kind of like, you know, they just... What, what made those give you that? that you know, sometimes you just feel like the song, you know, there's there's one. Oh, and there's also this, the one that, um, it was actually for the Best Man film, which was, uh, the well, I won't say it was a duet because it was four of them, but it was like Case, Tyrese, Genuine, and they did a, tr a, a track for the movie, and I'm... I can't remember. I, I remember the The video. Best Man oh, I Can yeah, Be or something like that. Yeah, that's yeah. it, yeah. That, and, and it's... Sometimes, like, you get a chance, you get a song that's just so great to you, and you get to do a video to it. Yeah. So that's that's what makes it, like, kind of combined. You know, even when I did um, Let's Get Married with... Um, with uh, Jagged Edge. Jagged Edge. Edge. Wow, you one can get all that yeah, right, right? <laughs> one of my One of my favorites because of just the song. You love the song. So when you get to do a video to a song that you love, that you're literally playing over and over again in your car, it's that's the best, you know. that's when, and, when, and when the imagery connects... And you feel like you did a good job. Mm -hmm. That's that's what you remember. I think we should petition to bring back slow song <laughs> videos. There's right? no more of those. <laughs> they are not shown on MTV. You don't see them on BET. We need a petition yeah. to bring those back. Have Tim Story direct all those videos. <laughs> it was crazy. Back Outside then, his busy schedule. I, back then, they actually <laughs> looked at them, you know? So. <laughs> So you went on after that to direct Taxi with Queen Latifah and Jimmy Fallon. Yep. And now how did you get involved with that project? Because that was such a totally different kind of style. It was a French well, remake, correct? It was the a French, yeah. Yeah, French remake. For, yep. Um, well, I done, coming off a of barbershop, they, um, you know, you had your for, comedy credit. Yeah, yeah comedy. I had the comedy <laughs> credit. So now they were like, okay, yeah, he's funny. So, um, so I started looking for just something. And I knew I wanted to do, like, you know, I could have gone back and, and just kind of done something totally in the same vein. But... You know, there's opportunities out there that you get that you just got to take advantage of at yeah. some point. And I, and I knew I could, you know, kind of flex and do something different, you know, so it's something bigger. And still staying in the comedy world, I thought, okay, well, the next thing is, you know, I had done, a, you know, this ensemble comedy. So you figure, okay, am I going to do a romantic comedy or an action comedy? And this came up. And Queen Latifah was just coming off of um, either her Oscar nomination or it was her, um, it was, I think it was a combination of her Oscar nomination and the movie she was in with Steve Martin. And so she was really big. And, and what's weird about Queen Latifah is I knew Queen Latifah when I was younger because her best friend and my sister were on the same basketball team at USC. So I kind of had run into Queen Latifah, and I even think, I'm actually sure, uh, that we opened for her once in Los Angeles. So I have a very crazy. blessed life. Yeah, so I'm like, wow. <laughs> so it was world. really weird. So so I kind of knew, you know, kind of knew her. And when this project came up, um, I just thought it would be fun. And and Queen Latifah was attached, and it was like, I'm in. You know, just let's go. And I remember seeing her at a party one time, and it was, me, you know, and we were dan and we saw each other on the dance floor, and it's like, so we doing this? Like hell yeah! And so it was on. <laughs> you know, it was on. And um, and then we of course went after who was going to be you know her co-star, and Jimmy Fallon came out of a, a conversation at one point, and we went to meet with him, and he was like he, he you know he's just he's the greatest, and so we uh, we said yes to it, and we kind of went and made it and shot New York, and um, kind of that's all she wrote, I guess. Yeah, it seemed like a really fun film. I mean, both of them obviously have huge personalities. Yeah. Was there any funny story that you remember from, from filming that movie that stand out to you? Uh, if not, it's okay. But it, I, I don't. Like, it was just, it was always just fun. Like, it, they got along great. Um, you know, uh, you know my, my sets are kind of very relaxed, and we just would laugh every day. You know, I, I just think in most cases when it comes to a comedy, you know, having a good set and having a fun set kind of, you know, seeps into to the what you film, so. What did you find different about going from like a large ensemble comedy to just directing sort of those smaller? With 
Well, it, you know, I, I never made it easy on myself. So even though I was directing um, a smaller cast, mm -hmm. I still had now visual, you know, small, small little visual effects and action and all of this other stuff that That's I brought in. So it was one of those... Um, yeah, I lear my learning curves have always been really, really big. I don't know why I do that to myself, but <laughs> you know, you're learning how to to deal with you know blue screen and green screen and okay, and these cars, and now you've got a second unit director who's doing a whole sequence over here that you're not a part of. You're you're tell you you know you've talked about what it is, but when it gets back, you go oh, so that's what okay. So and now you have to <laughs> wrap your head around there. So you you have to learn how to make almost two movies at the same time. So. The you know the the learning curve was was um, pretty big, but it was more of the physically doing the movie. As far as the cast was concerned, it made it definitely easier, um, mm -hmm. just because you're not having to with barbershop. Literally, it was like every day you had about 12 people you were directing because it's not just the cast. There was uh, customers that were in the, right. the shop as well, so you have to constantly know where everybody is and what their story is and. You know, actors want to know, Tim, what am I doing at this point? So I have to really map out every character with every scene, whereas this one, you only have to worry about two. And mm -hmm. so definitely made it easier, but at the same time, I'm really hard on myself about being prepared as much as possible for what the actor needs, And um, but then at the same time, stay out of the way and let them do their thing. Well, and I'm just sitting like a little kid right now being giddy after you just said about the learning curve because it's so interesting to see people who, you know, you're obviously learning as you're going. Mm -hmm. What was the biggest learning curve for you going from that into Fantastic Four? Well, it's it's Fantastic Four, I threw, once again, through everything at myself. Like, it's it's visual effects. So now you're, your visual effects, your, your second unit... And then you're also creature design. You're you're making yeah. creature makeup, and so, not to mention, you know the, you know, costuming, designing costumes are not are like a whole another world as well. So you're you're really trying to direct all these things, and so, I must admit, the first fan four was just uh, uh, well, you were like looking all over the place because you had to you had to really take people's advice and kind of hear what they had to say yeah. and let them okay, we'll, we'll deal with the visual effects. I had a visual effects supervisor, and you would talk to him from a storytelling t standpoint, but you would have to let them do their thing. And then when it came to second unit, you talk to him about what, what you need to accomplish, but then at, at some point you have to let them do it. And so you have to learn how to direct, like, you know, d you know really three, four different movies at the same time. So the learning curve was um, big and, all, and, you know, and at times overwhelming, you know, just yeah. because you're, you're trying to figure out, okay, but... It shouldn't be like that. Or, mm -hmm. and when do you, when do you, if it's not right, when do you stop and say we need to go somewhere else? Or, and so there's a lot that you have to learn. And for the most part, you know, at the end of that movie, you, what was what was cool about the end of that movie is you really learn it's storytelling. Yeah. And at the end of the day, that's not right. Stop. Like, no, we're not. Let's not do it that way. Let's let's find another way to do it. And you don't always have to have the answer, but you are in charge of directing you know the direction you know um of what what it is and so you really learn quickly that if if you if you you know you kind of know what you're doing you know if that if that design is not right it's not right mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter how much you know um experience you have in that field it's just not right let's figure out another way to do it or here's what i need to accomplish you know you can do it but here's what i need to accomplish and you and you stay you stay on it until you get what you need, and so um, so yeah. So the learning curve was was huge. I mean, it's going from a, uh, I think I want to say tax it was thirty million to a hundred million dollars, yeah. mm -hmm. and you know we built the uh, we built three hundred feet of the Brooklyn Bridge. Yeah. And, you know, when you first get on the movie, you're like, okay, well, how so how are we gonna film on the Brooklyn Bridge? And yeah. You're like, no, 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 we're we're gonna build it, and you and you see the Brooklyn Bridge being built, and you're like, holy, you know, whatever. <laughs> so um. It it was it was really it was really crazy. It's like nuts. and like filming it. What, what, was there like a moment while you were directing where you kind of just sat back and saw? Because obviously with blue screen things like that, you have to you can't see the finished project right, till yeah. the end. While you were filming, was there any moment where you're just like, oh my god, I can't wait to see visually see what this is actually. Oh, absolutely. Like, it's one of the scenes. There were times where you're just kind of like, well, even even doing the Brooklyn Bridge. So we. We built 300 feet of the Brooklyn Bridge, and we only built half of it because, of course, it's right. huge, you know. <laughs> so we built half of it down the center, and then you've got blue screen 
totally around you. So you couldn't imagine the amount of cranes and just mm. you're looking at like what. It, so one of the biggest things was how New York was going to be around us yeah. as we shot this yeah. thing. And then, of course, you start to see the plates being put in and there's New York. And you, know, you can't really you can't really tell, you know, so you're going, oh, my God, you know, and then even on that same sequence, you know, there's a fire engine that, you know, is supposed to, you know, teeter over the edge. Okay, so we're going to grab a fire, and here comes the fire engine on a crane, and it's teetering over the edge. So you just, you're constantly, you really kind of realize that we can do anything in film. It's, yeah. it's, um, and it's, a, it's even more amazing now that you, now we wouldn't even probably build the bridge, you know, but right. it's, <laughs> there's so much you can do, and I had to learn, like, really quickly that whatever I kind of could think of could be done. You know, there's a time factor and a money factor, but if, you know, there was, I remember there was a moment where I said, um, you know, I couldn't tell the distance of the, the, how high up they were. And I said it would be good if we saw something fall and splash in the water because then you get a sense of depth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so they put a car in there, and the car falls and splashes <laughs> in the water. You go, oh, okay, you so th that. that's how you do it. Okay, <laughs> so it, it was that constant thing where you just constantly. But um, I, I must admit, you know, seeing... Johnny Storm as the torch, you know, fl yeah. flame up and, yeah. and go was pretty. Classic, it's classic. Scene pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah, you're pretty awesome. <laughs> I mean, any any comic, but I, I'll even say any any you know person that knows superheroes, you just know that you're creating an iconic character that people have been waiting to see, and it's really it's pretty cool. Was that difficult? Because you know we see so many movies now that have have obviously created a comic book or taken a comic book and created a movie. Was it was it difficult for you to keep the validation and the the authenticity of the original comic book and create it into this big screen movie was it was it hard to do that to it you know yes and no i mean there were certain things that you could you could get right on you know there were there were other things that even as simple as um the thing in his brow you know we couldn't do the brow as much as we wanted to because it created a problem for lighting and and you know just the way it was so there even down to those details where you you wanted to do that but you couldn't do it yeah. and but um, you just kind of learn that, you know, as long as you kind of deliver the spirit of what it is, and in some cases, you know, you want to be pretty dead on. You know, um, you know, we knew the thing needed to be what it needed to be, but in terms of how big he was or whatever the case may be, you know, the guy is probably really like 10 feet tall, but <laughs> right. that wasn't going to work for right. us in, in, in this, uh, you know, formation of the movie. So, you know, you just kind of have to, um, you, know, some, you know, you also learn, too, that, you, you get a lot of responses from fans and people, whether they liked it or not, and this and that. And you just kind of, like, you know, grab, you know, have a, have a thick skin. And yeah. if, as long as you know, you, you, you know, there's so many circumstances. And, of course, you guys can imagine with these films, there's, there's producers and yeah. film companies and production companies. And, you know, there's a lot of agendas going on. So you kind of do what you, you do your best and you move on, you know, and... and Keep it rolling. What kept you centered with all of that coming at you on your first? I mean, this is a hundred million dollars compared to you know only a fraction of that before. You've got producers, you've got studio, you've got comic book people that are expecting certain things. You're you know first black director on such a large um, budget sort of film. What kept you focused and centered when you were having to in those moments of being overwhelmed? Yeah, well, you you realize what uh, you kind of go back to why you got the job. I you know. The reason I got that job is, is, and I remember Avi Arad, who who ran Marvel for some time and um, is a producer on most of, a lot of these films, um, you know, said I I was brought in because I know how to make family a family squabble, and at the end of the day, the, you know, and that's what barbershop was, even though they nobody was related, it was a family, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. fighting at their dinner table every day, and you know, when it comes to the Fantastic Four, they're a family, and at the end of the day, I just had to come back to why I got the job yeah. and you just kind of go one thing I do know is how to make families fight and how to make them <laughs> you know still lovable but at the end of the day they come together and you know you can you know I can talk about my sister but you can't talk about my right, sister. right. It's, it's that kind of thing <laughs> and at the end of the day I brought it back to the heart and what wh what's at the core of the of the movie and you also learn to with enough movies under your belt that especially at a, with a movie with that budget you know what we figure it out like we're all we're all professionals if there is a problem there's a you you learn when to s let something go because you can fix it later and there's times where you don't let something go because you know 
that's I can't fix that later. So you kind of learn your battles and the proper timing of battles. And I just kind of am centered in the sense that with this amount of money and nobody wants to fail in this project, you kind of go, you know what, you, you learn when to say, I'll let that go, you know, and let me just focus on what I can do right now. And, um, and you know, and, and, and it kind of, you, you, you figure it out, you know, um, and if you've got the right cast and crew with you, and, and many times you figure it out in, in a great way, you know. Well, you obviously uh, had a lot of fans with both movies. Uh, you went to gross over six hundred million dollars. I mean, that's. I mean, I, it's hard for me to say that. There's right. so many zeros attached <laughs> to that. But was there an added pressure to you as a as a black director? Because now you're looking at yourself, who you've had some success. You've had Barbershop. You've had Taxi. And now you're going to go to direct this huge film that is from a huge studio. And you are a black director. Did you feel like that you were kind of being looked at in a different light versus maybe a non-black director who would get this project under them? Never. Um, w one of the things about me, and I just think um, doing, you know, so even being in Hollywood, you know, I, it, it's kind of like the, I had to really take kind of the, the black part of my title out. Yeah. And just, um, you know, the fact that I got the movie you know, I'm I'm definitely not on the the bad side of the, what the, how they're looking at me. You right. know, I'm like they gave me this this opportunity. So my thing was just be damn good. You know, I'm yeah. just I'm really on myself about be good. You know, and and study all types of movies, not just black films. Study study everything there is because when I make a movie, I'm trying to make it as good as it can be. But I'm also if you're going to do quote unquote comparison in any way. I don't really like to do it, but for purposes of conversation, if you're going to compare the movie with whatever, yeah. you you want to kick everybody else's ass, you know? And yeah. and it doesn't matter if I'm doing, you know, um, you know, barbershop. Sure, I'm going to back and look we looked at car wash and we looked at all these movies that had, but I'm also looking at, you know, stripes and and movies that I grew up on and and that are just kind of, you know, whatever, you know. So, it's um I never looked at it like that. I always looked at it as if I'm going to go in a room, I'm going to be better than anybody else that's gone in that room. Yeah. And if I'm and if I'm not, I didn't. I, in those cases, I didn't get the job. You know. And sometimes you do also understand that it's political reasons why sure. you might not have gotten a job. So I just kind of go in and say one thing that's not going to happen is I'm not going to walk out of the room and they go, eh, he was, you know, he wasn't that good. You know, at least I'm going to walk out and they're going to say, okay, you know, the, the kid had his stuff together. You know, we can't give him a job, but, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, the kid, <laughs> kid had his stuff together. And that's the way I am. I, I just, I go in it um, with a, a focus on making the best movie. Not Never in any any movie I make, I'm never out to make the best black movie. Right. I'm out to make the best movie and I'm out to be the best director I can be. And the I must admit, the title of black, I have to like really, really put on the burner because... Um, I wish I could remember the quote, but I remember Will Smith, you know, you know, it's, it's like you, you're the one that brings that into the room, you yeah. know, it's not, it's true. and don't get me wrong, I understand that there may be, you know, meeting, closed door meetings that I'm not privy to that may have, you know, you know, uh, turned it one way or another for somebody else's, um, you know, um, whatever you want to call it, but I walk in and just say, you know, I'm going to get the jobs that are, that are meant for me to get. And it's going to be because I'm prepared and I kicked ass. And when I get the movie, I'm going to try to, I'm going to make it great, you know. And, and if I, and I kind of found that out with Barbershop and with movies like Think Like a Man. When you make a movie that's, and I, I will say, when, what we set out to do with those movies, I accomplished. I won't sit there and say they're great or good or anything like that. But what we set out to do, we did to the best we could do it. And what was that full goal for, for you? To well, do it was to create a movie that, in bo in both those situations, create a movie that made you laugh. Made, like I, I, especially in those types of movies, I want to go through the entire emotional, pers mm -hmm. you know, um, spectrum. You know, if I can make you laugh, cry, so forth, you know, mad, uh, you know, all of that stuff, then I think. And if I can make you fall in love with these characters, and the story makes sense and comes full circle, and every you know everything is tied up, then most of the time you're going to have an enjoyable you know, experience. Yeah. And if I can make it enjoyable yeah. where you kind of feel not always, you know, you feel better than when you came in for those particular movies, then um, I figure you'll come back. And what's cool about those movies is knowing, like with Barbershop, knowing that the, uh, there's a barbershop in every n neighborhood in the world, yeah. 
I, the more specific we were with those films in terms of these people, these characters, the more universal it was. And so I just find that you know you make a you make a good film that's authentic to the experience and the characters and this and that. You'd be surprised we're 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 a lot we're we're more the same than we are different. Yeah, you know, that's kind true. of thing. And like think like a man. Uh, obviously, it was you, you did that later down the road. What was it that kind of brought that uh, from your past films? Kind of did you bring to the table for that movie as far as relationship wise? I mean, you like you said, you know how to make family fight, and it's that movie everyone can relate to it because we've all been in a relationship. Yeah. What from I mean, whether relationships from Fantastic Four, from Taxi, d did you bring to that movie to kind of make it different than the rest? Well, I'd wanted to do, it kind of helped me complete a, a dream of mine, which was when it comes to comedy, I've always wanted to do all the different comedies. And one thing I hadn't done was a romantic comedy. And, you know, we don't like to say it's a romantic comedy. We, we call it a relationship comedy. But at the end of the day, it, it was a romantic comedy. And I, you know, my, my favorite movies were like, you know, you know, When Harry Met Sally and movies like that. And I just... I knew that it, it was it was time to do something like that. And when that script um, came to me and I read it, first of all, I laughed out loud when I read it. And then it also made me think about barbershop. It made me think about, you know, the ensemble piece, the um, the humor of it. And also, too, I could pull so much from my own experiences with those characters. And one of the coolest things that you hear from people when they talk about Think Like a Man is the fact that we, you know, everybody could say, I either am or knew somebody, just like, like most that. of the, yeah, you know, somebody sure. in there relates yeah. to me, you know, or I used to be that guy or, you know, or whatever. And so when you hear that, you know you're making something that's authentic and speaks to, um, you know, speaks to everybody. And what I brought to it was kind of my own relationship experiences that I knew when I read that script, I knew what the movie should be. There, there's, you know, it, it's great when that happens. When you read a script and you go, I, I know exactly. I see this movie. I'm, I've already shot it in my head. So let's just let me get the job now, so I can hopefully finish it. <laughs> I'm really? starting to see a theme here. I think you're a romantic, Tim. You know, you got the I'm slow so jam. Damn. You know, videos. I'm, you got the. I heard man. you say Harry met Sally. Yeah. I'm seeing a theme oh, here. Oh, absolutely. Think like, like a man. I like this. Trust <laughs> me, man. I'm, I'm, I, you know, I am definitely that emotional guy that. You know, and I and what you learn as you get older is it's okay. You know, yeah, I like all good. I, love I it. like laughing. I like um, I like romance. I like you know if I can make you cry in a movie, cool. You know, um, but I also like to make you if I can make you scared and this and that, great. But it, that's what's cool about as you get older. Like when you first start off, every film, you know, student wants to make The Godfather or he wants <laughs> right. to make Seven. You know, <laughs> right, so you want to make right. something really really crazy. But <laughs> here, like I learned very early on, I love laughing. Yeah, I love I love to make people laugh, and if I can do that, you know, there's a lot of you know laughter humor comes out of drama. So I get to kind of make you know two movies at the same time, you know. Well, I, you speak of laughing and, and drama, and kind of we were talking about being a romantic. I noticed in Think Like a Man, you didn't have any overt sex scenes. Was that a conscious choice for you? Because a lot of movies now we see they just go right for the nudity, and this like you're saying, you were telling a story and. It wasn't so heavy in this movie. It kind of left it to the imagination of the audience. Was that something that you chose? It was, yeah. It was something that, um, you know, the the producer, you know, Will Packer and I talked about a lot in doing the film. Is that you did not, you know, the, you know, there's a sexiness to this this movie, and there's going to be this undertone that's always there. And what I wanted to do is make sure we never really crossed that line because I felt like if we were laughing enough and you know and, and don't get me wrong I was gonna make sure there was a lot of kissing in it and this right. and that but there's um there's a sensuality to the movie that mm -hmm. I wanted to be sure we we were um we trusted you know that we, we trust that people get it people yeah. know what they went home and did people know <laughs> yeah. so and and I don't and I just I don't believe in crutches you know it was one of those films that I just knew didn't need that you know it was it, it didn't need it and you learn to trust you know that People are gonna get it. They're gonna in their head. They're gonna be thinking, sexy this and sexy that. And and um, we made it a point. And look, we also knew that I didn't want to go overtly because I knew I wanted it to be PG-13. I wanted as many people to be able to see the movie as possible. And um and but you know, getting back to the point, I just I just knew we didn't need it. You know, if we did what we were supposed to do, um, especially knowing that such a big audience to, to this movie was gonna be women. Yeah. That 
you know, guys were a little different. You know, we can stand a little bit. We're visual. But women, there's there's so much more to, you know, the secrecy of, of emotion and, and, and this and that. And I just thought that if I can if I can do something that's really poignant and deep and emotional, all this other stuff like that, and the women don't find it offensive, then I thought it would be a better film for that. And um, I, hopefully it was, you know, it was successful. Success. Well, it, it, it clearly was. Right. Yeah. And you guys are doing part two. And yeah. now I noticed that you've worked with Kevin Hart a lot. You've worked with him in this film. You have him uh, in Let Me Explain. You've directed him in that. Yeah. And also the coming up Ride Along. Yes. Uh, is there is he one of like your favorite favorite comedians or like how does that connection? He's he's one of my favorite people. Like he's um, it's really interesting with Kevin. Uh, Kevin was going to do um, the first one, which was Laugh at My Pain. And he wanted to do like a skit at the beginning of it. And he kind of, you know, I, th I think between talking to some people of this and that, he kind of found me and basically called up and said, I want to sit down and talk to you about this movie and I want to do a skit and I just love Barbershop and I, I want to, you know, work with you. And I was like, and I remember my agents got the message first and they were like, this guy Kevin Hart is looking for you. I was like, give him my number right now. Like it was, I want to sit down with him immediately. And we sat down. And we talked about working together and doing some stuff. And what was so cool about that meeting is that we basically said to each other, we got each other's back. We're going to yeah. do a bunch of stuff together. Let's do it. And what's so cool is that's what we've done. Like, literally, that, the first thing out of that meeting was laugh at my pain. Then I got Think Like a Man, you know. And then, of course, Ride Along 2 came. We shot Let Me Explain right after that. Then we just shot Think Like a Man. And now we're, you know, we've got plans to do Ride Along 2 in the event it performs. So where he's kind of my guy, I'm his guy, and we're just really close. And I, I think I get what makes him funny. You yeah, know, it was, yeah. a, it was the same with That's Cedric. Important. You know, yeah. it's like I get him, you know. And I think I, uh, you know, he, what he laughs at, I laugh at. And so when you find that synergy between an actor, um, you want to just make as many films as possible, you know. And it's... It's fun like that, you know. So Kevin is just, you know, I, I can't say enough. It's like I, you know, he's not a comedian to me. He's a friend. He's yeah. just my boy, you know. Um, this I, is his year. Yeah, this is his year. This I think year. it's going to be his, hopefully his decade, you know. He's, yes. He is really just a talented, he, he's so talented, so smart, and he gets it. And what can fans expect for, for Ride Along? Ride Along is going to be pretty hilarious. I got a <laughs> chance to work again with my guy, Cube, so... Me and Ice Cube, a reunion after barbershop. And he and Kevin together are just hilarious. I mean, you can picture it now. Yeah. The straight guy <laughs> and Kevin bounce all over the place. Um, for those of you who don't know, the story is based on um, Cube plays this hard cop. Kevin plays a uh, cop in training. He wants to be a cop. He just got um, accepted into the academy. But the biggest thing is he wants to marry Cube's sister. And so he asks for a hand in marriage. And so Cube, who hates his guts, decides I'm going to take you on a ride along and try to scare you out of one being a cop and two marrying my sister. And so craziness ensues and um, <laughs> I don't want to give away too much but um, it's pretty hilarious what, what, what goes on. What were some, uh, as you say, you, you know, before you do a movie you watch a lot of old movies that inspired you. What were some of the research films for you? For this oh, one? we, we uh, watched uh, 48 Hours, watched Beverly Hills Cop, <laughs> I was just watched uh, Hills Cop. Midnight Run, um, just like a lot of those buddy, those buddy comedies that you just, you know, went back and watched Rush Hour. It was just, um, you're looking at all those buddy cop comedies that just, you remember and just kind of figure out. Even, even some of the dramas, even going back to watch Thelma and Louise and, and movies like that where two people are put together and just, why is it, you know, there was such, you know, and in watching Thelma and Louise, even though it's a drama, there's some funny there's moments. Some, yeah, there's, there's a, there's a, a comic funny, tone to it. Yeah, yeah, you know, which it just comes out of human nature it and does. just two characters you know, screaming at each other. So I just, you know, went back and watched all those and just kind of figured out, you know, what, <laughs> what what this should be, you know. And you get support from a lot of actors, but do you see, in Hollywood, is there a lot of support from other directors that you've You noticed? know, I, I think for me there is. I, you know, my, I think you guys can kind of get my personality. I, I've got a lot of friends. I, I remember, um, you know, got a chance to kind of hang out with, you know, F. Gary Gray for a little while where yeah. we literally had known of each other for so long, but at some point we actually had a chance to just, I went out, he has a ranch, and, you know, um, I won't say where, but he's got a ranch, and <laughs> we went out to, to hang out. <laughs> you know, people be knocking on the door. Which you want to tweet yeah, that exactly, out real yeah, quick. Exactly. <laughs> but I went out to his ranch, and we just got a chance to kind of like, this was around the time when everybody was doing the DSLR cameras, and 
we took lenses and equipment and we were just out there shooting and I'm very close with um you know David Talbert and John Singleton and you know George Tillman Jr and just a lot of the guys even Malcolm Lee and, and I'm just that guy you know I kind of um you know the good thing about this is once you do get a job you're on it for a year and a half yeah. so it's not like the competition is so much like or right. this and that so um I find myself I'm actually you know friends with a lot of them and we don't get to sit and talk often, but when we do, it's really fun to kind of, you know, I remember after Thing Like a Man, I remember F. Gary Gray calling me and kind of telling me, even though it's a romantic comedy, he saw the camera work. And Gary has this eye that's just, I tell him all the time, it's like, if I had his eye, like his eye is just so incredible when it comes to, you know, you know, just some um, composition and stuff like that. And um, he called me, and for him to call me and tell me that was pretty cool, you know, because, yeah. <laughs> you know, you look up to what he does, and, you know, for him to say that, and even um, you know, so you, so I, I'm I'm close I'm close with a few of them, you know, and just because um, I learn from them and and some of them I really look up to. And when it comes to F. Gary Gray and Singleton, I grew up on their work. You know, yeah. I grew up. You know, I was in film school when they started hitting their stuff, and so it's um it's kind of cool to kind of go back and you know talk to them. How do you feel about the future of upcoming? I'll say black directors. I know you used a little. You used a state, statement earlier where you said that it's not about necessarily being black. You just want to make the best work that you can do. But there are obviously a lot of filmmakers who are going to go to school because they look up to you and they see themselves in you. I mean, see them see themselves from you. Um, what would you say is the future for black directors? Do you think that is it's optimistic as far as getting big projects like yourself? You know, I, I think it. I think it is, but I, I think it is in a in a kind of a different. A different situation because the 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 industry has changed so much. Well, there's not a lot of um, if you grew up wanting to make dramatic movies, there's not a lot of opportunity for that right now, just because they don't make those um, that that um, it's kind of like we we've, we've said in Hollywood, like f from forty million dollars to like eighty million dollars, they don't really make the the dramatic movies that we grew up watching, you know. Yeah. Um, and you know, like your sevens and stuff like that. So Would you have you say to kind of thirsty for that right now. It's thirsty, but what what's filling that thirst is television. And so I think That's what true. the what the um what what the caveat to black filmmakers coming up is that there's a there's a a bit more of opportunity in television at, at the same time. Yeah. So if you do, you know, I've I've been able, I uh, quote unquote, to stick around a little bit because I do comedy and comedy right now. It's comedy and it's fantasy, big action you know, superhero, whatever you want to call it. And then there's indies. But there's um but there's nothing there's not a lot in, in the middle there that used to be there. So you kind of um even romantic comedy there's not a lot there's not a lot of those as many as we might think that are being made to this day. So when it comes to black filmmakers, I just say you have to kind of look at the uh, the the options, the alternatives, yeah. which is film or or um internet series and stuff like that. So there's there's opportunity in that where you may have to make your net, yourself known in television yeah. before you go into feature yeah, film, or you, you may know. have to make yourself known in doing your own little indie, you know, shorts uh, or indie like open up your own channel, which you can literally do at this point. Or you might have to look to look to Netflix, Netflix, or you know, all these companies are now starting their own film television divisions. Sure. You know, um, from Google to Amazon to to Hulu to all of these places, and so you just have to kind of be open to the non-traditional or the non-way of what you're what you made might have grown up on but if you're you know look if you're young enough then you're growing up on that anyway true. so yeah, you just have to kind of like open your mind to maybe it's not doing film first it might be doing this other thing first which gets me the film mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. i think the um the 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 future looks really really bright but i think you have to you keep your eyes open to if you if it's not film it might be Oh, let me do this internet Other series avenues. over here, yeah. which will get me to where, where I want to be. And if you had one word to define you, what would it be? Um, <laughs> Speechless. <laughs> He's yeah, pondering you, the question. Yeah, I'm pondering the question. <laughs> one, one word. One word. <laughs> uh, they gave you the music. <laughs> that's that's pretty good. <laughs> that's pretty um, good. <laughs> You know, I would say easy. Easy? <laughs> and what do you yeah. mean by that? I mean, it's like, it's almost like the old song, Easy Like Sunday Morning. Easy you Like know, Sunday Morning, Commodores. I'm, I'm, you know, I've, I've had, I've been very blessed with, with the career I've had. I've got an amazing family, an incredible group of friends, and just people that have helped me along the way. 
And so I'm very easy in the sense of I, I accept what, what's given to me. And, and sometimes that is stuff that I want that I don't get. Yeah. And, um, and I'm just kind of like, um, I'm having a good time. I'm, I, I, I always try to kick ass at whatever I do, but I'm also very open to what will be. You know, it, it's yeah. the, it's the, when I make movies, you know, there's the movie you write, there's the movie you shoot, and there's the movie that you edit. You know, at some point, the movie tells you what it is. And, you, sure. and, and if you fight it, you can sometimes not make the movie that it should be. And I've had to, in many times, you get into the edit room and you just didn't think that person's, that relationship would be as strong as it is, or in some cases, as weak as it came out. Yeah. But there's something else that's calling your name saying, but yeah, but I'm good. And there's, you know, the happy accidents that happen in movies. You really learn that if you're not open to let them happen, especially in comedy, then you can really, you know, miss out on something that's great. And so I'm just kind of, I'm easy. I'm like, you know, I just like that word, easy. Happen, you know? Easy. We got to give him a T-shirt. <laughs> right. <laughs> easy. Well, we're gonna we're kind of wrapping up the interview, cool. but we want to move to uh, another set of questions. Uh, we call these kind of our fun questions. Okay. We got your background now. Now we're gonna, you know, have a little extra fun with some of the questions here. So I'm gonna start with five. Okay. And uh, the first question for you is, what is your favorite gangster rap song? And it um, has to be gangster. And it has to. I'm emphasizing gangster. <laughs> gangster. Right. I would probably. Well, that's not. It's it's by a gangster rapper, but it's not gangster. Um, I guess you know we'll we'll let us. That was fine. We can we'll, do. We'll go rap. We'll go with favorite that. Rap. favorite rap song. <laughs> favorite favorite rap song. Gang, favorite rap song. Or favorite gangster rap song. Well, who are you? Whoever. Well, you were I was thinking. Say. I was thinking. Uh, one of my favorites is just. Um, Ice cubes. I ain't the one. I ain't the one. Yeah. You know, just it's it's not gangster, but it's just the thing about it was just always really really cool to me. It so. brings the energy. Too. It brings the energy. <laughs> it brings in. All right, your I'll favorite movie of all time. Favorite movie of all time is. There's a couple, but I'm gonna break it down to one. I will say the Shawshank Redemption. Excellent yes. movie. Excellent movie. Um, yeah, that, 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 I, I was just watching it. On that yeah, no, I was just watching it not too long ago, so I'm like, oh, I like that. On that one. All right, um, should the N word be abolished from hip hop music? I would probably say it's weird. My answer, which I'll give in two seconds, <laughs> my answer it kind of comes from what I think will be, and that is, I would say no. Okay. And the reason why I say that is because it won't be, you know, it, it won't, it, it will, you, you know, rap or, or, you know, comes from the street and that, that word is synonymous with the street and True. until the street changes, that word won't go anywhere, <laughs> you know, and, True. you know, so. If you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be and why? It would probably be. It would probably be Italy. And why? Because I went to that place and fell in love with food, wine. There's a there's an energy about that place that it's it's like you're you're working to live, not living to work. You know what I'm uh, saying? Yeah, it's like yeah. there's a there's just a beauty to like that place that I just fell in love with. Is so. there a city in particular in Italy or just you just Italy, yeah, just Italy. Right? Like, just Italy in yeah, general. just you know, I was able to go over uh, quite a few parts of it, and just I'm I'm a big wine, I'm into wine now. So it was just, but and, and food, you know, just the the passion they live with is like, oh, I wish it was. I wish we lived with that passion over here. It would be pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. My last question: biggest pet peeve. Biggest pet. Something that just gets under your skin that people do, or it's so funny because I have so many of these that I'm trying to. Think <laughs> well, you know what's funny? I'm so I hear so many directors have so many different pet peeves, probably because you work with so many different people. Yeah. Um. Um. I see them brewing too. Oh my god! Like <laughs> it's so weird that you ask me this because I always have them and I see them and I go, uh, um. Think he needs the music, Phil. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, we got different music. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I've put too much on it now. I can't even. Like, I can't even think. Of, now I'm thinking of the petty ones, like the, 
Like, Just name one. What's a petty well, one? A petty one is when you're when the button's already pushed at the elevator and somebody comes and pushes it again. Oh my god! Oh, I do hate that one. <laughs> that is it. I do hate that one. Like that's a good one. That's a good one. Actually, a lot lit. of people do like, it too. Like what? What's gonna Did happen? Did you think I couldn't you, do it the like, first time? Right, it's lit. Like and then they push it like a couple times. And then they times. push it a couple times. They do. I wonder if that's a nervous habit. Like or that's something. gonna bring it right. faster. Like it's gonna bring it faster. It's just yeah. it just drives me nuts. You know, uh, <laughs> Jesse, Jesse, Courtney, what do you guys have? All right, so we would like to know what do you think the most underrated film of all time is? Like the movie that you watch, and most people are like you watch that. Under okay, so um, so in other words, I thought it was great. You thought and, it was great, and but nobody most people are like what? Oh my god! Please don't oh, say, look, please don't say the movie I have in my head right now. <laughs> Under underrated. Uh, wow, what a good question. <laughs> that is a good question. Jeez, underrated. No, because the thing is, some of those ones that I think people like, it got its music, please. It got its just do. Um, <laughs> that's totally a wrong that's answer. That's wrong. Um, oh my God, most underrated movie. Um. No, not that one. Um, <laughs> I'm so, I'm I'm it's drawing okay. a we'll, right. we'll get it on it's Twitter. Right. We'll get it we'll, on Twitter yeah, we'll later. Twitter we'll send it out to yeah. our guests. You can think about it a little I'm bit. I'm drawing longer. a blank. Okay. We'll we'll come back to you on that one. Okay. You want to go with one? Jesse. Uh okay, so we're gonna play a word association game. Okay. I'm gonna say a word and you just tell me the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. Miley Cyrus. <laughs> Young. <laughs> Trayvon Martin. Wrong. George Zimmerman. Um, confused, confused. Hip hop. Swag. 2013 hip hop. Um, um, <sighs> uh, ow, it was, um, <laughs> um <laughs> Um, t -t 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 you're definitely the best person we've asked questions because you score him. We got. I love it, right? And he thinks about <laughs> it too. I love it. Uh, um, let's see, 2013 hip hop. Wow. Um. God damn it! Um, <laughs> I, and I and I know what I want to say. I just can't think of the word. Um, you can uh, describe it whenever. Like like. It, uh, or, uh, like I'm trying to say not good enough. <laughs> like um, mediocre, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe mediocre, mediocre maybe right. mediocre. And then, out of this isn't a word association, but if you could put the Tim story kind of curve on one of these movies, which one would you choose to uh, direct? Batman, Superman, Spider Man, or Godzilla? Ah, wow. Um, wow, well, it'd probably probably be Godzilla. I knew it. I knew yes. it. I knew it. That's what we're hoping for. <laughs> Probably be Godzilla, because that could be funny. There you go. Well, thank you, Tim. Where can your fans find you on Facebook, Twitter, any Instagram? Oh, my God. One of my – I'm uh, Tim K. Story on – I think that's Twitter. And then uh, Instagram is, I think, T Story 88 And then TimStoryFilms.com is – no, TimStoryPictures.com is my, my website, so – and in theaters. And in theaters. Yes, and in theaters. I'm going to find you right now in theaters, actually. <laughs> Courtney? Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Stuart Starlet. Jesse. At DJ Jesse J. And I'm at Dario Christen on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you guys for tuning in to Black Hollywood Live Portraits. We also want to give a special appreciation to our guest, Tim Story. Go to see his movies. He's got, you know, Think Like a Man 2 coming up. He's also got uh, Ride, Ride Along. Along. And in theaters right now, we have Kevin Hart. Let me explain with Kevin Hart. Kevin Be sure to check him all out and add to that $600 million that he gets in grosses every year. So. <laughs> every, year. Right. every year. Every year. I all would. Right. Let's just put his financial statements on. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys for tuning in. From producers Maria Manunos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svita, Dario Kristen, and the entire BHL staff, we would like to thank you for tuning in to the Black Hollywood Live Network. If you have questions or comments, tweet us at BHL Online or email us at info at blackhollywoodlive.com. For more exclusive content, visit blackhollywoodlive.com.
This has been a presentation of the Black Hollywood Live Network. Hollywood, Hollywood redefined. redefined. The views expressed here are those of the host owner and do not necessarily reflect the views of BHL or its owners or principals.